All right, so we're in Genesis chapter 1, but I'm actually going to come back to Genesis chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. So the Bible teaches that God's word is very important. You know, it's, it's just as, or actually more important, than our everyday food that we eat. And, you know, if we don't get God's word, then that's a problem, right? You know, and if someone were to change God's word or alter God's word in some way, that's also a problem. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, and what is more foundational than, you know, God's word? And, you know, everything we get that we believe is straight out of the Bible, straight out of God's Word. So if that could be changed or altered in some way, I mean, we don't have any foot to stand on. If someone could just say, well, hey, the Bible doesn't really mean what it says right there, you know, then what are we going to do is what that's saying. You know, ever since the beginning, you know, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, you know, it talks about, or, you know, where Satan, you know, the very first time he's quoted in the Bible, he's saying, hey, yea, hath God said? He's just casting doubt or causing Eve to question did God really say that? Are you sure about that? How do you know? You know, what does that do? And that's just, well, I don't know. Did, did God say that? I mean, I'm not sure. Well, you know, the same has happened today. You know, God, you know, there is an attack on God's Word. The devil is attacking God's Word now, just like he did back then. And if you want, you can turn to 2 Peter. You can keep your finger in Genesis. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says... As also in all his epistles, talking about Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. So it says here that there are some people that, that are unstable, that are unlearned, they rest, you know, that, that word rest, it starts with a W, because it's like wrestle, or like wrestle, we'd say in the South, right? as they do also the other scriptures. So there's some people that are fighting, they're wrestling the scriptures. They want to change it. They don't understand it. They want to corrupt it, right? Well, you know, this is, this is done in a lot of ways. You know, there's a, there's a documentary that we have, you know, New World Bible, New World Order Bible versions, where there's all, it talks about all these different, you know, versions of the Bible where it's changed or it's, there's parts of it removed or, or what have you, where whole verses are even taken out. And it's changing God's word. You know, that's, you know, that's pretty important. You know, if, if we don't have God's word, what do we have, right? And see, there are other ways to change God's word. There's more than just changing, you know, the actual book, the actual words found in the verses that we can change God's word. There's other ways to do it. You know, if we could change or affect the meaning of God's word or change the meaning of how we understand it, well, you might as well just change it at that point too, Right? You know, that's like when people say, well, if you go back, you know, if you read this verse where it says, you know, where it says, you know, God is willing, is not willing that any should, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, that word all doesn't really mean all, because if you go back to the Greek, the word all means, you know, whatever, something different. And, you know, hell doesn't really mean hell. It means something different right. or, or whatever. Or believe, actually, to be saved, really, if you go back to the Greek, it means you know, have works or have a changed life or whatever. Well, even though they're not literally changing the book, but they're still changing it in some other way. And that is just as dangerous, right? You know, and t t this morning, I want to focus on another way that God's Word has commonly changed, and that is just through other ways that would define what God's Word means. So the title of this sermon is The King James Dictionary. The King James Dictionary, because God's Word here acts as its own self-defining instrument, right. oftentimes, probably the majority of the time. And so that we don't necessarily have to rely on some other book or some other you know, resource to understand what God is telling us or what God means. Because ultimately the words are just as important as the meaning. If we, if we have the words but we don't know, know what it means, well, we're just, we're just as up a creek without a paddle either way, right? <laughs> So, the reason why I call this the King James Dictionary is because uh, this, the Bible acts as its own dictionary, right? And 
sometimes, you know, you would go to another dictionary, Webster, Miriam, or whatever dictionary written by man, and you would compare, you know, a word in the dictionary, uh, compare it to a word in the Bible, and you're going to get two different meanings, right? Sometimes the, diction the dictionary definition in, will conflict with how the Bible uses it, or how God uses that word. And we need to realize that the dictionary is not the gospel. The dictionary written by man could be wrong. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using the dictionary. Yeah. And most of the time, the dictionary is going to be fine to use. But sometimes it could be different. And we just need to be aware of this. And this sermon is going to go through how these things, thank you, how these things work. And, uh, and first, I'd like to talk about this principle of first mention. You know, people will refer to it as the law of first mention, which basically is like, when the, the very first time a, law, uh, a word or a phrase or a subject is mentioned for the very first time in the Bible, a lot of times the Bible or God will define that word for us, what it, what it means or something you know, important about it. Uh, but it's not an exact. It's not like you're going to get the full definition the first time every time. So that's why I call it the principle of first dimension. Because yes, you will find that, but it's not a guarantee for every word all the time. Um, so, you know, you, you, you really you have to look at every time that word or phrase or subject is mentioned everywhere in the Bible. You can't just look at the first time and just automatically assume, okay, well, there's the law of first mention, so that's what it means every time, because that's not always going to be true. You have to look at every mention, get the whole picture, and then you can come to your conclusion about what that subject or word or whatever it is means. Even if it conflicts with something else, whether it be in a dictionary or whatever it is you already are thinking. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit. Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the way that we understand God's Word is by comparing spiritual things, which this book is the only spiritual book out there. There are other false spirits or unholy spirits that you can say, well, this is a spiritual book. No, the Holy Bible, the King James Bible in English, is our spiritual book. And the way that we learn the Bible is comparing it with that which is also spiritual, which is the Bible itself. You, you learn the Bible by comparing the Bible with the Bible. And there are many ways to do that. And as opposed to this, you know, comparing it to man's wisdom. That'd be like comparing it to a dictionary. Well, the dictionary says this. So I'm going to go with that. No, we don't learn the Bible that way necessarily. It's, we, we need to allow God to define himself for us. Right? So you're in Genesis chapter 1 still. The reason why I picked this chapter to start with is because Genesis, you know, he's defining everything, right? You know, it's, you know, you want to talk about the principle of first mention. He's mentioned everything for the first time. It's the beginning of the Bible. You know, he's defining days, you know, defining, you know, sea, you know, night, all these different things. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Skip to verse 5, and he says, And God called the light day. All right, well, that's... There you go. You know, now we know what the light is referring to. It's daytime. It's pretty basic. This is just showing how God is just defining for us what He means. And, you know, this might be pretty simple. And then He goes on and says, And the darkness He called night. So, you know, we don't have to wonder what the darkness is, right? It's nighttime, right? And the evening and the morning were the first day. Skip down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth. Right? So we don't have to wonder what the Bible means when it says earth. It's, it's the dry land. And the gathering together of the waters called he sea. So it's real basic. He's just defining everything, right? And, you know, this is a helpful tool. You know, when, when we want to understand a certain word or a subject, we can just see what the Bible says about it, the first mention and all the mentions, to see what it's talking about, see what it means, right? So now I want to go through some just some common words or some common examples of how the dictionary or the Bible in the Bible will sometimes conflict, right? So this is, if you want to write anything down, this is what I'll, this, this will be, uh, 
uh, this part of the sermon will be the dictionary or the dictionary written by man versus the King James Dictionary. Okay, we're going to see how, how sometimes they don't go together. So the very first word I want to I use as an example here is the word repent. So the word repent is, just the, I mean, everybody knows here probably, it's the classic example of how the dictionary definition of, of the word repent and the Bible's definition and how it's used is a lot of times very different. And it's not the same, right? And you say, well, why does this matter? Well, you know, people will say in order to be saved, you have to repent of your sins. And they'll say, if you go to the dictionary, the dictionary says repent means to turn from your sin. And then they'll say, so in regards to salvation, we have to repent, right? And therefore, that means we have to turn from our sin. But that's not what the word repent means in the Bible. I don't care what the dictionary says, right? The word, and, you know, and here's the first time the word repent is ever used in the Bible, Genesis Chapter 6, verse 6. You go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 3. And this is not going to be an exhaustive study of the word repent. You know, I'm going to go through several different words to show how they can be different. But, you know, so you can go back and learn and, or look up all these words and see how they're all used throughout the Bible. But this is just a real snippet of each example here. And I think this is really enough just to show, you know, from the Bible what these words mean in of itself, but it's not, it's not the full study. So in Genesis chapter 6, you're turning to John chapter 3, and verse 6, this is the first mention the word repent is ever used in the Bible. So this is an example of the principle of first mention in use here. It says in Genesis 6 verse 6, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. So this is the Lord, this is God right. repenting. So what does God have sin? No, every Christian will tell you, no, God doesn't sin, God is perfect. I mean, that's, that's obvious. So if the word repent in of itself means to turn from sin, well, how could this make any sense? If God's turning from his sin right here? No, obviously not. So you can see right away that the dictionary definition of the word repent does not jive with what the Bible says. And what are we going to go with? We're going to go with God's word. We're going to go with the Bible. Because I think God knows what he means when he says repent, right? So you're in Jonah chapter 3. In verse 9, it says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not? So this is a great example of how the Bible defines itself. It repeats things over and over, and it uses different words, synonyms. So he says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Those two words mean the same thing. This is how the Bible uses the word repent. It means to Turn. Other places you'll see how it means to just change, right? It's not to turn from sin, because again, this is God turning and repenting. So if the word repent means to turn from sin, we would have just a very big problem. So the next example I want to use is the word wine. So the word wine in the, in the dictionary will say it's a fermented beverage, alcohol, right? Well, is this, is this what it means in the Bible? Well, Here's the first mention of the word wine. We're looking at examples of how the dictionary and the King James Dictionary, I'm, I'm calling it, can sometimes be different. How we need to be aware of this and how we need to go with the Bible. And so if you would turn to Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, this is the first mention of the word wine here. And it says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, it says, and Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. So Noah, he plants a vineyard, he, he, he drinks the wine, and he's, drunkard, and he's drunk, and then he gets naked. And he's, and he's passed out naked. And if you read the story, and then his son Ham comes along and does something to him, right? So he is drink. He's drinking alcohol, right? Well, so you could say, well, there you go. So alcohol means a fermented drink every time. So there's the law of first mention. I don't need to look up the other mentions to know what it means because I see it right there. And it jives the dictionary, so no problem. What are you talking about? Well, no, because other mentions in the Bible, you know, it will be there will be a positive mention. You know, where Jesus is turning the water into wine, for example. Right, or he says, "Hey, drink a little, you know, wine. You know, you mix the, you know, drink, mix the wine in the water and drink a little for your stomach's sake." And see, these are good examples. And you might think, "Well, 
how does, you know, a lot of people will think, well, then you just need to drink a little wine, like uh, drink moderation, drink, drink in moderation, just drink a little alcohol, and that's what they say. But actually, wine means both a fermented drink, alcohol, and non-unfermented drink, you know, just fruit juice, right? It could be, it could be either or. So, you know, and, you, and the Bible defines that for us. You know, we don't have to look at the dictionary because the dictionary will just say, hey, it's a fermented drink. Most dictionary definitions will say it's just alcohol, that's it, that's all you need to know. But what we have to understand is the King James Bible was translated over 400 years ago. And sometimes English can change the way that we use it. And it'll be different a lot of times in the way that it was used when it was translated in, you know, 1611. So... Our, our current modern dictionaries could be different, and that's why there are these type of differences. So to understand what God meant or means when he says wine or anything, we need to look at God's word, let it define itself for us. Because in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8, this is another mention of the word wine, and this is a different use of the word wine than we saw in Genesis chapter 9. Because he says in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. So here we see that the new wine, you know, the fresh wine or the brand new wine, it's found in the cluster. What's a cluster? It's, it's a bunch of grapes. That's what a cluster is. So if there's wine in the, the cluster, in grapes, well, how could that be alcohol? Because, see, there, are, there is no alcohol content inside of a cluster, inside grapes. So this is clearly shown as an example of how wine can be used just to refer to fruit juice. Because that's what's inside of a cluster, juice, not alcohol. That doesn't, that doesn't get created until after the, the juice is separated and outside of the cluster, not in the cluster. So what I'd like to point out about the Genesis 9 use you know, in the law of first mention here is, you know, sometimes... The, the law of first mention, or the principle of first mention, he'll define something for us completely. Sometimes he'll only define it in part. So we'll get some of the meaning, or a lot of times God will just let us know something very important about that subject or about that word. Like here, in, or what we saw in Genesis 9 is, hey, with wine, a lot of times it is alcohol. And let me tell you what goes along with that. A lot of times it's going to be some freak molesting you, because, you know, that's what happened if you read the story, because he curses his son Ham. And because of what he did to him when he was passed out naked and drunk, right? So this is something that would be nice to, to just know every time you read wine and it is the negative example. A lot of times it's, it's because it's alcohol, right? But other times it could be the positive. You know, when Jesus is turning water into wine, it's not alcohol. Right. Otherwise, he'd be committing a sin. And, when, and now we're back to kind of what we were talking about earlier with how God doesn't have sin. So, you know, a lot of times words have more than one meaning. So we don't want to just have this two-dimensional approach into understanding God's Word and just think, well, wine just means wine, wine means alcohol, and, you know, we're not going to accept any alternative definition for those words. There are plenty of examples of how words have multiple meanings or, or different meanings a lot of times. You know, like the word suffer, for example. You know, we use the word suffer, the way the Bible uses the word suffer a lot of times, as to go through pain or torment, right, to endure something uncomfortable, right? Well, you go, you go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 13, and I'm going to read to you uh, from Luke chapter 9. So you're going to Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to read Luke chapter 9, verse 22, where it says, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things. So Jesus, the Son of Man here, is going to suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So this is the use of the word suffer being, you know, used to talk about going through pain, going through, you know, something uncomfortable. He's going to be slain. He's going to be killed, right? This is what we usually think of. But there's also another use of the word suffer, and it means to just allow or to permit, right? In Mark chapter 10, where I had you turn in verse 13, it says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, you know, you know, brought them to Jesus is what the story is. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. So he says, suffer the little children. He's not saying, hey, we're going to torture these kids. 
That's, I mean, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to allow them to come to me. Don't, don't refuse them. Don't just keep them from coming to me. Hey, that's, this is how heaven's like. So yeah, let them come. Allow them to come. So this is an example of how one word that we use all the time, or, or at least we do use it, maybe not every day, of the word suffer, how it can mean to go through pain, and it could also just mean to allow, but yet we don't use the other all that much. So words can mean two different things sometimes. Right. You know, and usually those different meanings are related. Because you can see how go, you know, enduring something uncomfortable could go hand in hand with allowing something that you maybe don't want to happen that could be uncomfortable to happen, to allow that. You know, uh, so you can see how these things can be related, but they are different. And just like with wine, you can see how, okay, it's both juice, but one is fermented, the other one is not, but they still have different meanings. So, in, uh, now I want to go to the, another word, another example. So I'm just basically going through different common words that are often uh, twisted or by, either by the dictionary or something else to mean something else. Something else by, uh, than what the Bible uses it as. So the next word I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about here is the word conceive. So we talked about repent, we talked about wine, we talked about suffer. And now I'm going to talk about the word conceive, because this is another word that if you go to the dictionary, you're going to get a certain uh, list of possible definitions, and which is, happens to be different than what the Bible says. And which one we're going to go with? We're going to go with the Bible says, but we need to know what this is. So if you go to the dictionary, it'll say conceive means to you know implant when, whenever uh, the blastocyst or whatever it is, the, uh, uh, whatever they call it at that stage, I don't even know. Whenever that implants... That's conception, is what they say. And then they'll call it these, all, all these different terms. Well, you know, uh, and, and, and they won't call it a baby. They'll just call it you know, whatever the substance is. They just kind of demonize it or, or dehumanize it, rather, in that way. Right. But let's see what the Bible says or, or how it uses the word conceive. And, this is, and I'm going to show you another way that the Bible acts as a self-defining instrument here. Because the Bible will often quote itself. It'll have a verse in the Old Testament or somewhere in the Bible, and then it'll quote that somewhere else, and there'll be some slight differences. And the differences are not, you know, God's Word not being preserved, or, oh, there's a contradiction or something different. He's actually showing us how things can be used interchangeably when He does that. And I'm going to show you this with the word conceive, because uh, you go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to read from you uh, from Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, this is a prophecy about our Lord Jesus where it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we see there where it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Okay. Well, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, this is quoted, and it's almost quoted exactly, except there's just a couple of differences. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, uh, behold a virgin shall be, not conceive, or it says, shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So here we see how the word conceive is being used interchangeably with to be with child. Right. So when you conceive, it's not a blastocyst, it's not an embryo, it's a child. It's not just some substance that you can flush down the toilet or sell for, to, to make money off of. It's a child. It's a baby. Right? And if you get rid of that, if you abort that, it's murder, is what, is what the Bible says. And, you know, or manslaughter at best. You know, so here we see how the Bible quotes itself to define what, what does God mean? What do you mean when a virgin is going to conceive? Well, a virgin is going to be with child, is what that means, what the word conceive means. And also... It, it, the Bible lets us know when conception happens because the, the dictionary will tell us that conception happens at a certain point in time. It'll say, yes, it could be when the seed from the man and the egg from the woman come together. They'll say that's conception. But then they'll say, or it could be when that, that conceived or fertilized egg, you know, later, a week later, will implant into the walls of the uterus of the woman. They'll say, well, that's conception in the dictionary. Well, does that jive with the Bible? What does the Bible teach about when conception happens? At what point? What point is it? Is it a child? Because people today are trying to murder their babies, so it's really good to know. Well, when is it a child, and when is it not a child? Right? When does conception happen? Well, in Hebrews chapter eleven, verse eleven, he says, "Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, 
and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So here it says that Sarah, when she conceived, when she was with child, she conceived seed. Well, in order to conceive seed, the seed has to be there. If you're conceiving seed and the seed's not there, well, then that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, when implantation happens, the seed is not there. So that cannot be conception. The Bible says it's seed that is being conceived. And you know what? That's when the seed and the egg come together. That's when it's conceived. You know, it doesn't really take a genius to figure that out, figure that out when life begins, right? So don't let the dictionary fool you or whoever else say, well, it could just be implantation or whatever. It's a child and it's a child the moment that the seed from the man and the egg from the woman come together. So those are some uh, examples of how, you know, the dictionary and, you know, the King James dictionary could not jive or conflict, right? And we want to make sure, we just want to be aware of that. You know, I'm not saying don't use the dictionary, because the dictionary is fine. You know, as long as you realize that it is man's wisdom, it's something written by man. So it's not authoritative like God's word is. So if you see a difference, you need to go with God's word. It's just something to be aware of. Now, something else, another way that people or man will go about to change what words mean. They won't take the words out of the book. They're not going to take verses out like the NIV does or whatever. They're just going to say, well, it just means something different. Now, this is this section, if you want to write this down, this is going to be commentary and preachers or study Bibles versus the King James Dictionary. Because a lot of times the dictionary is not what the problem is in understanding a word or, or a subject. It's just the commentary or the study Bible or the preacher that will get up and say, hey, this word means something else than what it does mean. And I'm going to go through a couple of uh, examples of that. So the first word I'm going to use in this, uh, in this section is the word tribulation. Now the word tribulation is, is kind of a buzzword in, in churches, right? How we're not going to go through the tribulation. Most, most preachers will say that we are not appointed God's wrath to, you know, as Christians, so therefore we're not going to go through the tribulation. That's what they'll say. Well, does tribulation mean God's wrath? Are those things the same? That's what we need to know because that's what I've, I've heard my whole life. You know, I'm sure a lot of people have heard that too. And we want to see, well, what does God mean when He uses the word tribulation? Well, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 13, in verse 21, Matthew 13, 21, it says... Yet hath he, he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So this is, a, this is a, a parable that Jesus has given about all these different types of people that either receive the word or don't receive the word. This person is the example of the person who is like the stony ground who receives the word, so they're saved, but they don't endure you know, because they can't handle the tribulation or the persecution. So they're like the, the seed that grows for a little while, but they don't have a root in themselves, and they just, they're just they not fruitful. They don't get people saved. They don't serve God. So in this verse here, in this parable, he, so he's saying how these people that don't have root in themselves, they, they uh, where, where am I here? All right. For when tribulation or persecution. So he says these people, when tribulation arises because of the word or because of the cause of Christ, or persecution. So you see again how he uses tribulation side by side with persecution. These two words are very closely related. Because so the word tribulation just means trouble, affliction. You know, this is basically this is what it means. So what the trouble is is really is really what the question is. Because see, there I think there are mentions in Revelations where God is pouring out his wrath on unbelievers. And you could call that tribulation. It's a type of trouble. You know, it's a type of affliction. But are we as Christians going to go through tribulation? Because that's really how the, the Bible commentaries and the study Bibles, they'll say, hey, well, we're not going to go through tribulation as believers. Well, let's see if that's true. You know, you go to, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So this is the same book, 1 Thessalonians, okay? And it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. And the us in the chapter is the children of light, we that are saved. So this is what he's talking about. We are not appointed as believers to God's wrath. 
Okay, well, that's good. Amen, right? Well, is tribulation, does that equal God's wrath? Well, let's see. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, he says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. So here he says, hey, we are appointed tribulation. We are appointed to afflictions. So we're not appointed to God's wrath, but we are appointed to tribulation, yeah. to affliction. So again, he defines tribulation, and he uses tribulation and affliction side by side, because these are the same, these are synonyms of each other. So, is God's wrath and tribulation the same exact thing in every way? No. Because in the same book, it says, hey, we're not appointed to wrath. We are appointed to tribulation. So, when the theologian or whoever says, hey, we're not going to go through tribulation, because the Bible says He has not appointed us to wrath. Well, those things are not the same thing. Right. So, you need to be aware. So, whenever you're listening to someone preach, the Bible says when you listen to preaching, you know, you're supposed to judge. You know, you're not just supposed to, okay, yes, sir, whatever. You think about it. You know, you, you, you prove these things, right? So, the next word I'm going to use that the theologian or the, the Bible commentary where will often twist and give you a different meaning of the word is the word paradise. So, the word paradise has a lot of confusion around it for some people, I guess a lot of people. And they'll say, well, paradise is hell. Or paradise is a place in the center of the earth where hell is or beside hell or whatever. It's down, you know, in, in the center of the earth, they'll say. Well, the word paradise is only used three times in the Bible. And I'm going to, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. So this is one of the three mentions that the word paradise is used in the Bible. And he says, and Paul is speaking, he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So, and then he repeats almost the exact same thing again. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise. So, he says the almost the exact same thing. He's just repeating himself. This is, this is how God defines what he means and what he's saying, is he just uses repetition, synonyms or very closely uh, or the same sentences almost with just a few differences. And here we see the third heaven being used interchangeably with going up to paradise. Because up to the third heaven and up to paradise is the same thing. So if paradise is up and it's being used interchangeably with the third heaven, how could paradise be in hell, down in the nether parts of the earth? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, what about, the, and I'll go ahead and go through the other two mentions. I'm not going to read them, but... The other, uh, another mention of the word paradise is in Revelation, where in, in, in that mention, the throne of God is in, the, is in that paradise. So God's throne is in paradise, it says in Revelation. Okay, well, does that sound like hell to you? In the Bible, over and over, when you read about God's throne, where is it? It's in hell, right? No, it's in, it's in heaven. Heaven is His throne. The earth is His footstool. And the third mention is, you know, this is the one that confuses people because... Jesus told the, th the thief when he got saved on the cross, beside Jesus, when Jesus was dying on the cross, hey, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. People say, well, Jesus went to hell that day because Jesus went down into the heart of the earth. So if Jesus said to him, hey, you're going to be with me, then you're going to be in the center of the earth also. So they get confused by this. That's why we need to look at all the mentions of the word paradise or all the mentions of any word or any subject to get the full meaning, because the other mentions are clear. That's the third heaven, it's where God's throne is. Well, what about this mention? Well, go to John chapter 3. Because, yes, it is true that Jesus went to hell, and Jesus went to pay for our sins that day. And, yes, He did tell the thief on the cross that you're going to be with me that day. But what did He mean by that? What, is, what did Jesus mean by that? Because... You have to understand that Jesus is God, right? right? And Jesus said that I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, that's why it's accurate for Jesus to say, hey, you're going to be with me in paradise when that man who just got saved and he died the same day went to heaven because the Father and Jesus are one, even though Jesus went down to hell. 
And, you know, there's another example of this exact same thing in John chapter 3, verse 13. This is when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, And no man, this is Jesus speaking, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Well, who is that? Who, went, who is the one that came down from heaven? It's Jesus. Jesus came down from heaven. And he says, Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus right here. He's saying, hey, where is he? You know, where's Nicodemus? They're on earth. He's saying, hey, no man has come down from heaven except for the Son of Man, which he's talking about himself. Even the same where he says, the Son of Man, which is in heaven, which would be right then, right now. So he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, hey, I'm with you. I'm the Son of Man, and I'm also in heaven. What does that, what does that mean? What's that talking about? Well, again, he and the Father are one. So yeah, it, it makes perfect sense if he tells the, the thief on the cross that you're going to be with me in paradise when he and the Father are one. So you know, this is you know, hopefully that makes sense. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here already know that. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is not an exhaustive study on on any of these words. So hopefully, I'm not throwing out more questions than answers. Uh, but I'm going to go to the next example now. <laughs> So now I'm going to go to another word that's commonly used or twisted by the theologian or the Bible commentary or whatever, and that is the word elect. Because the word elect is another favorite. They like to take that word, you know, who are the elect? Because you're going to hear that the elect are the Jews. That's, you know, that's what I've heard my whole life. If you read, you know, Schofield or whatever, he's going to say, oh, the elect here in whatever the verse in the New Testament, that's the Jews. Well, let's see. Do the elect equal the Jews? Let's let the Bible define itself. Let's let the Bible tell us who the elect are, or who the elect is. Uh, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8. You can turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is where you're turning. I'm going to read Romans chapter 8, verse 31. So this is, this is a verse that I've heard my whole life in Romans chapter 8 here, referred to and applied to Christians, we that are saved. Okay, he says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. And that's, that's talking about believers, and I agree with that. He says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for, his, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Which is talking about the Jews. What he says is, hey, it's us, right? We that are saved. Well, the next verse he says, It is God that justifieth. So who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So those that are justified are the elect. Well, are the Jews justified? How do we get justified? Well, look at Acts chapter 13, verse 37. He says, But he whom God raised again, who did God raise again? Jesus. Saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, what, what man? Jesus. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things. So those that believe in Jesus, on Jesus, they're justified. Right? What else does he say? From which he could not be justified by the works of the law of Moses. Uh, by, the, by the law of Moses. So you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. You can't be justified by keeping God's laws, keeping God's commandments. It's only by believing on Jesus. Well, do the Jews believe on Jesus today? No. What are they trusting in to get them to heaven? It's works. The works of the law. They have to keep the law. So they're not justified. Therefore, they're not the elect. Because that's what we saw being used in Romans chapter 8. You know, and I could have turned to this next mention. Go to Romans chapter 11. Because this, this verse just blows it out of the water of who the elect are and who they're not. In Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Are the Jews the elect? Well, let's see. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained. And the rest were blinded. So here, he's making a contrast between Israel, which have not obtained because they're seeking it by the, the law of Moses, salvation, and then the elect we, they have obtained because they believe in Jesus. So if, if the elect are the Jews, if the elect are Israel, then this verse doesn't make any sense because, hey, they have not obtained, but the election has. So the elect is, are not the Jews. The elect is actually Jesus Christ because He's the chosen one. 
And anyone in Christ, anyone who puts their faith in Christ, is chosen too. Amen. And that could be anybody. But it's not just some Christ-rejecting Jew. You know, that, that, you know, that's not how you're elected at all. Chosen for what? Chosen to go to hell is what they're chosen for. Unless they believe. I mean, they could believe just as anyone else. So, all right, so those are just some definite, those are some examples of people, or not people, <laughs> people are going to go to hell, but th those are some example words of, of how people will take Bible words and they'll change them in their Bible commentary or their sermon or whatever. Now I'm going to look at some just everyday word meanings versus the King James. So we saw, you know, dictionary words versus the King James. We saw the, you know, the Bible commentary versus the King James. Now we're going to look at everyday words that we use all the time versus the King James. Because sometimes we, you know, we'll use words and we'll apply those meanings that we understand them to mean to the Bible, and it, it's not the right meaning. And, you know, and you know, and so that's why it's important to not just go in the Bible uh, assuming anything, right? That that it is what we think it means. Let's let the Bible or God tell us what He means. And the first example I'd like to use is the, the word evil. So when we use the word evil, we use it to basically mean something that is wrong or sinful, right? But is that what the Bible uses it as? Is that, is that definition to ring true in God's Word? Well, we were just in Jonah 3, uh, so we're going to actually go back there if you want to turn. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it says... And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. So here it says that God repented because He saw that they turned from their evil. And then it says that God turned from the evil that He was going to do. Wait a minute, if evil means wrong or sinful, then God was going to do something wrong or sinful? No, of course not. You know... The word evil just simply means harm or to hurt in, in some way. So, yeah, God was going to destroy them, and that was going to be harmful to them because it wasn't going to feel good. It wasn't going to be nice. But it wasn't wrong because He was justified to do that because they were wicked. But when they turned from their evil, their harm, it actually was wickedness in that way because they were doing something that was sinful that also was harmful, right? So this is just a distinction we need to understand. And another example I want to use is the word bad. So bad you know, is very, very similar to the word evil. We use evil and bad probably interchangeably in our everyday speech. But the word bad, does it mean wrong and sinful? Well, let's see what the Bible says. You go ahead and turn to Leviticus 27, verse 14. Does bad mean wrong or sinful? I'm going to read to you in Jeremiah 24, as you're turning to Leviticus 27. It says in Jeremiah 24, verse 2, it says, One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are past first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. So he says that these figs are good on one hand, these other figs are bad. Well, are, are figs sinful? Oh, these are the wicked, sinful figs. They're going to go to hell. These figs are going to hell. Is, I mean, is that what he's saying? No. He's just saying that they're, they're rotten. They're, they're no, they don't have any value, right? So the word bad is used in the Bible to mean something that doesn't have value, something that's worthless. It's just, it's naughty, right? It's not like naughty or nice. It's just, it does, it's of naught. It has no meaning, right? It's nothing. It's just not valuable. And you, you're in uh, Leviticus uh, 27, verse 14. It says, When a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad, as the priest shall estimate it, so shall it stand. A, a house cannot be wicked. A house cannot transgress God's laws. So and it, it's just if it's a worthless house or if it's a valuable house, good or bad. So this is just some other false understandings of words. Or they're not false understandings, just how we use them versus how the Bible uses them. And we need to ha keep that in mind when we're going into reading the Bible and studying the Bible and, and, and know what God means when He says these things. Another example, the word meat. Right? M-E-A-T. We think meat as the muscle or flesh off of an animal we're going we're gonna to eat, right? Like a chicken bone or, or a chicken leg or whatever. Well, the word meat is in the Bible is just used to simply mean any type of food, right? All types of food. And in Leviticus chapter 2, you're already in that book. It says Leviticus chapter 2 verse 1 is talking about different offerings of the Lord. And in chapter 2, he goes over the meat offering, right? 
some of the offerings that they would offer up were actually animal flesh, muscle, what, you know, whatever you want to call it, that type of meat offering. But the offering that was called the meat offering wasn't flesh at all. Let's see what it says in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. So there's no meat component the way we think of meat. It's just oil, it's just flour, and that's the meat offering, and some frankincense, right? And, you know, you could read the rest of the chapter and see there's no flesh added later to where now it's the meat offering, you know. So that's just another example. So here, those are just different ways. So whenever you read the Bible, you need to make sure that you're not just going into it with some preconceived idea. Well, the dictionary says this, and the dictionary is what I believe. Well, I believe in the Bible. So when the Bible conflicts with the dictionary, I'm going to go with the Bible. Or when the Bible conflicts with the commentary of the preacher, well, I'm going with the Bible. If the Bible conflicts with just what I already think the word means and how I use it all the time, well, I'm going to go with the Bible. And this is something we need to keep in mind when we're reading and studying God's Word. So, <clears throat> you know, another, another great thing about this, you know, way that the Bible is set up for us is that it'll teach you words that you never heard of or that you don't even know. You'll read a word. If, if I was to tell you a word, you know, and, you know, ask you what does that word mean, you probably, I don't I have no idea what it means. But, you know, if you saw it in a Bible verse and how God defines things for us, it's like, well, now you know what it means. And but through that, you're actually learning a whole bunch of vocabulary. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. God's word is a, is a great teacher. God's word will make you smart. That's why, you know, when you watch people, they start reading the Bible, or people that nearly get saved, they start reading the Bible. They have this outward appearance of just getting smarter. You can tell it's, it's, it's working. You know what I mean? So... Here's a, this time I'd like to just point out, uh, go through some examples of this. This is a book, it's called uh, Archaic Words in the Authorized Version. So they're supposed archaic words because every word in here is actually going to be in a modern dictionary. But these are words that we don't use in our everyday speech now in English. And so you might not know what they mean. And so I'm going to go through a few examples of words that we don't use, but they're in this book and they're in the Bible. But if you just would read the verse that they're in in the Bible, you're going to know exactly what they mean, or very close what they mean. So the first example is, uh, I'm going to use the word yoke fellow. So does anybody know what yoke fellow means? Maybe got an idea? Okay, the people, the people that know the Bible. <laughs> but most people, I mean, I don't use that word every day when I'm at the gas station. Hey, this is my yoke fellow. Like, what? Your egg? What? You know, yoke. You know, so yoke fellow. So on a page, let's see here, page 429. He shows us the yoke fellow word. Yoke fellow. So the Bible example that he gives in this, uh, for this word is Philippians 4, verse 3. And he says, I entreated thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. So... Right away, you know, if you're listening to that verse, he uses the definition for the word yoke fellow in this verse over and over. You know, he says, my laborers, my fellow laborers, you know, because yoke fellow just means your fellow laborer, <laughs> your, your work associate, you know, your fellow employee is what we would say. Right. So there you go, you just got smarter. Right. You know, if you're reading the Bible, you just, you just learned a word. It's not that complicated, right? You know, uh, I like another example, uh, you know, surfeiting. You know, like when you're at the beach, right? No, that's not what it means. Surfeiting, uh, let's see what it says. Uh, 357 on this book, if you got the book. So surfeiting, does anybody know what surfeiting means? It's S-U-R-F-E-I-T-I-N-G. Surfing, you know what it means? Quit raising your hand. You're ruining my point. <laughs> so no, hardly anybody, right? Uh it says in Luke 21, verse 34, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you at unawares. 
So what does the word surfeiting mean? I've never heard that. I don't use that word. What's it mean? Well, you see how he uses it interchangeably with, with, with surfeiting and drunkenness. And the word surfeiting just simply means gluttony, excess. There you go. You know, drunkenness is one type of excess. Surfeiting is almost the exact same thing, just maybe in food or some other excess, right? So you're learning all types of vocabulary, right? Banquetings. How about the word banquetings? Anybody know what banquetings are? You use that all the time, right? Come over, I'm having a, a you know, banquetings or whatever, right? So banquetings, uh, it says in 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, for the time past of our life, many suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. I wonder what that word can mean. You know, I have no idea. Well, you read the Bible here. It's listing all these other words. And these other words have a lot to do with banquetings. Lust, excess of wine, revelings, lasciviousness, and banquetings. Well, what does banquetings mean? It just means basically a feast. You know, some type of a party, right? It's not that complicated, right? Uh, all right, here's a word I, I bet you probably nobody will know. Uh, gleed. You know that one? This is, it's only used one time in the Bible. Gleed. Well, how are we going to know what it means? We can't compare it to another verse. So how are we going to know what it means? Gleed. We've got to go to the dictionary. Well, maybe not. Gleed. If you want to go ahead and turn there, actually. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'm actually going to turn there too. What's a gleed? We got to go to the dictionary. We got to go to the commentary. Deuteronomy 14. Let's see if we can figure out what a gleed is. Deuteronomy 14, starting in verse 12 says, But these are they of which ye shall not eat, the eagle and the ostrich and the osprey and the gleed and the kite and the vulture after his kind, and every raven after his kind. I wonder, well, I wonder what a gleed could possibly be. No idea. Got to go to the dictionary. What well, actually it just means, you know, a, a, a bird, you know, a carnivore, a carnivorous bird. You know, so it's really not that complicated. You know, I'm not going to go to the other example I have because I think you get the point. You know, you read God's Word, you got a word that you don't know, you don't use it, well, He's probably going to define it for you. You know, if there's a verse that's it's quoted later that's the exact same verse, well, maybe He'll define it there. You know, these are just really good teaching tools because really the point of this sermon ultimately is just to aid you in learning the Bible and to teach you how the Bible is set up, right? You say, well, okay, I get all that. You know, I see the Bible repeats itself. You know, the dictionary is, you got to take it with a grain of salt. You know, these other books you have to take with a grain of salt. So what, what, what else? What else do we take away from this? Well, you know, be eloquent like God's eloquent. What does eloquent mean? Well, it just means that you are good at expressing yourself. You, you can get your message that you're trying to teach or get across to someone else successfully. That's what it means to be eloquent. And the, the, the Bible is an eloquent book. And, and because God is very successful at getting His message across and defining things. So when you're out soul winning or when you're out you're preaching to someone or you're teaching you know, homeschooling or whatever you're doing, teaching anybody, remember these Bible examples of how God teaches us the way He interchanges words, synonyms, or the way that He you know, repeats Himself or, or He has this self-defining way of speaking. Remember that. Adopt that in your teaching method. That way you will be eloquent. You'll be successful at getting the person you're trying to witness to, you're trying to give them the gospel. That way they'll know what you're even talking about. You know, because I don't know about you, I don't want to go door knocking and talk to somebody for an hour and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Or they have a completely wrong understanding of what I'm saying. Well, these tools, this example that God has given us, yes, to teach us the, the, the Word Himself, but to show us how to teach is what I think we can learn. You know, we need to adopt these methods. The Bible says, you know, if you want, you can turn there in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 7. It says, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, this is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 7, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? 
For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. So, you know, I don't want to, when I'm trying to teach someone something, I already know what I'm saying. I already know what, I, what it is I'm trying to teach. I don't want to speak to the air. I don't want to just be saying words that are falling on deaf ears because they don't understand what I'm saying. So we, I need to use and we need to use words that are easy to be understood. And how are we going to do that? Well, how about we take God's example? How about we do like what He does when He wants to teach us and, and give us understanding to, you know, to, to us that are simple? You know? You know, I'm going to give you an example of a, of a wrong way to do this. You know, I was recently on a, a NIV church website reading their doctrinal statement of faith and all this stuff. And this is just a sentence uh, about basically salvation on, on their website. And it says, it says, the portion of the impenitent or people that don't feel sorry for their sin, which that's wrong right, right there. Because you don't have to be saved. You know, feeling sorry for, for your sins has nothing to do with getting you saved. And that's what he goes on to talk about. So he says, The portion of the impenitent and unbelieving is existence forever in conscious torment, and that of the, of, and that of the believer in everlasting joy and bliss. Well, that sounds real, real, real nice, doesn't it? That sounds real fluffy and feathery and poetic and just makes you kind of want to take a nap. But what is he saying? You know, I'm sure a lot of people that go to this website, they're, they're like, I don't know what he's talking about. How about just say it like this? If you believe, you're not going to go to hell. And if you don't believe, you are going to go to hell. Or if you believe, you're going to go to heaven. That's a lot simpler. How about just say it like that? How about you quit worrying about sounding so smart and fluffy and poetic and just focus on clearly giving the truth in love? I'm not saying we should try to offend people, but don't worry about not offending people when you're, when you're just saying what our statement of faith is. Right? right? That's not what God does. It's like they're afraid to use the word hell. You know what I mean? It's just, you know. So, in conclusion here, let's read the Bible. Let's study the Bible. Let's be aware of how the Bible is set up. And let's let the Bible speak for itself and define itself. Right? And let's be thankful for, that God has set up His Word this way. You know, we don't have to go to all these other artifacts. Or we don't have to go to these other resources to figure out what God is trying to tell us. He's made it easy. And, you know, let's adopt these methods while we're trying to teach others so that we can be effective the way God is. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to preach and I pray that this was uh, something that was a blessing to, to the people here and I pray that you would fill us with your spirit today when we're out soul winning. I pray that we could be uh, eloquent when we speak to others and teach others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.